that was at least 150 years old. <laughs> and uh, Sue and I tried to figure out what that was. And, and John Bailey said, whatever Sue wants to teach is fine with me. And uh, we landed on a- But I take that back. Okay, <laughs> yes. Um, oh, golly. Uh, Don, would you mind helping us get a couple of chairs out? I'm sorry. Um, and this is a book I've always known about, but I've never read. And so I've really wanted uh, to dive into it. And it seems like with all of you here, that may be true for some of you as well. Sue's had an adventuresome um, time over the holidays. Uh, uh, if you might share some of that, she may not. But uh, we are grateful that you're here, dear friend. So let's go ahead and get started and I'll help out. And you, you missed me talking about you. I, if it wouldn't torture you all, whom I adore, I would make that Hank read The Last of the Mohicans. Yeah. Yeah. In American literature, if you go back 150 years, Unless you like Hawthorne. Hawthorne. Yeah. <laughs> or Cooper, exactly. We've done Melville, then you're looking at, you know, uh, <laughs> the last of the Mohicans. Um, I'm glad you saw the letter. I know. That was one I had to read for some Well, I thought about early American. a different Hawthorne that most people never read called the Blythesdale Romance, which is not Puritany, but We'll think about that next time. So what Guy and I talked about, I just sent him a list of books I thought were beautiful. So we landed on um, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. And I'm so tickled that many of you have heard of it. It um, Certainly for our generation, it was a book that was much more popular in the uh, 50s and 60s and 70s than it is now. Um, unless you are teaching a class in Southern literature, Carson McCullers doesn't get a lot of play right now. That doesn't mean she's not going to make a comeback eventually, but this is a book I've always loved. Um, she, You are so trained to read this book. Um, it is uh, a modernist text, which puts it in line with, and it has a lot in common with Sherwood Anderson, um, Winesburg, Ohio, which we've already done. It's also a very Southern text. She's kind of Flannery O'Connor and Eudora Welty and Faulkner all mixed together to create this new uh, thing, Carson McCullers. How, has anybody read this book before? Yeah, I mean, it, it, a long time ago. But it was, yeah. when I was coming through school, but you know, I studied Southern literature. She was kind of a required reading, but she doesn't um, get read a whole lot now. So tonight, what I want to do is, you know, introductory stuff, give you the things I want you to think about. Um, my adventure over Christmas was that, apart from all my other issues, um, my husband fell out of a tree stand, 15 feet. <laughs> um, and just destroyed his ankle compound fracture. So it was like this wicked adventure in um, trauma, which I, I've i never been through, you know, I, by trauma, I mean the whole Vanderbilt trauma surgery thing. I will say we had a great experience there because they are the best for trauma. We started at St. Thomas and they went, yeah, no. And so um, they sent him over there, but he's doing fine. I mean, it's a long recovery, but He's just Paul. I told Guy, you know, he's over there praising the Lord with the Pentecostals <laughs> tonight. So he'll be all right. And we are so lucky. I mean, it was so horrible. But everyone <coughs> there kept saying, you're so lucky. Because usually that kind of accident is a broken back or a broken neck. So we're just leaning into that for now. So that was my... um 
adventure. And when you're empty nesters and all of a sudden you have to fulfill all of the needs of the person again, <laughs> I adore him. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and now he has a scooter, you know, this one legged, you know, the one. And <laughs> because he is a contractor, he is not a person to sit still very long. So this is torture in every way. But now he has this scooter and it's kind of silent on the hardwood floors. So sometimes I'll just be, you know, doing the dishes or something and look up and he's right there. <laughs> and I'm like, I adore you. Get away from me. But it's fine. It's all good. We have people in this group who do counseling professionally. <laughs> uh, Honey, just, just, just hold up your hand. <laughs> no, it's, it's kind of, it's just been weird to be together over Christmas break the whole time, you know, because that's <laughs> never happened, you know, in 20 years. So it's okay. Okay, that's my trauma. Let's get on to the good stuff. So let's talk about Carson McCullers. Um, I'm going to do the introductory stuff. And then I brought, although we might have to share copies, um, <clears throat> my favorite passage from Carson McCullers that actually comes from another book called The Ballad of the Sad Cafe. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll look at that together because I think this passage that I'm going to show you that we'll read together reveals more about her writing than anything else. So we'll look at that in just a, a little bit. So Carson McCullers, um, born in Columbus, Georgia. She had a remarkable life. She died fairly young. Um, because as a child, um, she was considered a prodigy, a genius child. And this is a girl growing up in the rural South. Um, She's born in 1917, right? So the end of World War I. And she was a musical prodigy, a pianist. And everyone assumed that would be her life. And she was trained. And she goes to New York um, when she's 17 but almost immediately gave up the music and devoted herself to writing. Um, she had rheumatic fever when she was 15 years old and that's what led to health problems that plagued her throughout her life. She also had a really unstable, difficult marriage. Um, lots of drinking, lots of carousing. And so all of that ended up kind of making her later adult life um, quite difficult. She published um, The Heart uh, is a Lonely Hunter is her first novel. And it's published when she's 23 years old. And so of course, the literati also immediately dubbed her, you know, this genius prodigy coming out of the South. And she became instantly famous with this book. But I think for a number of reasons, everything, most critics argue that she never wrote as well again. I don't believe that. I think the Ballad of the Sad Cafe is, is as good. It's a, some, a little uh, short book, but she's also someone that I think people struggled with understanding in the 50s and 60s. She was very controversial, you know, because she wrote books about infidelity and those sorts of topics that people thought a nice girl from the South shouldn't be messing with. So here are some things that she said that I think are gonna be important for our class. 
here are a couple of quotations that I want you to hear and remember. She said, I live with the people I create and it has always made my essential So for her, she was born Lulu Carson. And when she's 13 years old, she's a very Mick-like person, if you started the novel, never felt comfortable in her own skin. Always said it would have been much better and easier if she had been a boy. And so she gets to that age of 13 and drops the Lulu and starts getting a name and goes through that very tomboy adolescence for a girl in the South and never dropped it because she was from the beginning of her life different, kind of in every way. She felt essentially lonely and she felt that that was a key element or characteristic to all human existence that deep down we all have this essential loneliness that we are trying to assuage in one way or another so she says, I live with the people I create, and it has always made my essential loneliness less keen. All right, you ready for this one? This is a great, this is a very famous quotation, but I don't know. The theme, her central theme in all of her work, is the theme of humiliation, which is the square root opposed to the freedom, affiliation, and love, which is the square root of wonderful. But, girl, come on. So part of what she's doing in all of her texts is a search. Characters are searching. And more often than not, they're searching for a way out of isolation and loneliness. So very Winesburg, Ohio in that way. Is love. But for her, and we'll look at this more closely in a minute, she tries to define different kinds of love that people experience and is always searching for the most rewarding or enriching kind of love. And she's always trying to figure out what that is. And for her, that's the square root of wonderful, but you've got to do the equation and figure out what is it. So her central theme, she says, is the theme of spiritual isolation. So she's a very spiritual writer, which a lot of people don't even get. And so I want you to keep that in mind as you start. She said, writing for me is a search for God. If you read Carson McCullers, most people do not go, hey, this is a very religious sort of spiritual book but for her it is and I want to see if we can kind of tease that or parse that out as we're going through because what kind of makes her writing difficult for people is that in that very Flannery O'Connor way her fiction is populated by Southern grotesques. And grotesques, in a literal sense, there's something wrong with them. There's something that separates them. Sometimes it's physical. Sometimes it's behavior. 
But there are also grotesques in that Sherwood Anderson way. And if you weren't with us when we did Sherwood Anderson, his definition of the grotesque is when a person gets so <laughs> stuck on one truth for themselves, I define myself by this, that it usually becomes somehow twisted and you become grotesque. Does that... I, it might not make sense to you, but we totally tackled that. So her fiction is populated by grotesques, freaks. In that book, The Ballad of the Sad Cafe, the two major characters, there's a woman who is a giantess who's in love with a little person who's really creepy. <laughs> and so it's always that kind of what's going on here why is she drawing these characters this way and I think that partly explains why a lot of people don't get her or aren't attracted to her writing but y'all it's very folklore slash fairy tale like and you have to keep that in mind because She's telling these human stories with these exaggerated characters and you kind of have to do the work to figure out. This is a book about two deaf mutants. They're the central characters. And, a, and this is a book about communication in some way. How is this working, right? And one of the deaf Mutes, whose name is ironically, see, this is so fairy tale y. Singer, though he can't speak, right? Everyone is drawn to him, but he doesn't speak. Do you see what I mean? And so we've got to go, what is this? Is all so weird. And so that I think was something that without guidance a lot of readers would go this is too weird for me I don't even know what's happening here <laughs> but if you've read a lot of southern literature p.s it's populated by grotesque it, it just is we can talk about that later um so these are characters who are isolated by something that makes them um, grotesque and the extreme nature of the characters is supposed to call attention to what is universally present in all of us but in a much more subtle way and we got to figure out what are those things. So here are Carson McCullers major themes or ideas that she plays with and that you will see in this book and that we'll talk about. Her master theme, she says, is spiritual isolation. Critics, on the other hand, which is always fun, say that her master theme is unrequited love which is a manifestation of spiritual love. And when we look at this passage, I think this will be more concrete and clear. People searching for love that they never find, or as she describes it, in every relationship, there's a lover and a beloved, but they are not the same. And sort of James Baldwin in the sense that she also thinks that deep down most of us don't really believe we deserve the love that we want which is real uncomfortable for most of us when I say things like that I hear Miss Bobby's voice remember Miss Bobby mm -hmm. going girl I deserve it <laughs> but <laughs> yep. yeah but that's Bobby Gray for 
and you do you know the title of it? I missed and, her. And that is so Bobby. Oh, yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. I deserve it. Um so unrequited love. Love that is not returned in the way you want or the way you imagine it would be or should be. So that gets uncomfortable. She has a consistent sympathy for the lonely, marginalized people in the world. And it, as soon as you start this book, you'll get what I mean. You've got the two deaf mute characters who live in their own world, but are together. And then you've got Mick, who is surrounded by people, but is the cafe owner in his life. <laughs> in this marriage that is, I don't know, fraught. strikes and then you have the african-american characters who become very important um in the novel one is the doctor one is portia his daughter and you can tell when you first meet them that they love each other but again cannot communicate not that that happens in real life um can i interrupt you sure and I've not read the book, I confess, I, but I got it yesterday we have time. and started and I could not put it down. That makes it me so happy. It was that engaging for me, but grotesque is an understatement. Yeah, yeah, 100%. <laughs> and, uh, and I mean, as always, Sue has laid it out. One question for you that you'll probably get to hear Mick Kelly, whom she's mentioned, appears pretty early, and they're clear autobiographical. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, throughout uh, about Mick, whom we'll see, and uh, you'll love it. Stay with it. it, it I, as I say, I can't wait. I'm ready to leave here and go read. Uh, I love it, but I love that you said that because I don't. Well, we. We'll figure it out next week. Like, are you having that experience when you read? Because, well, I'll talk about this in a minute. Let me finish the themes and then I'll talk about how she puts the book together. Um, and some of you will honestly get this way more than I do because it's musical and I'm not musical, but I'll we'll talk about it. So Unrequited Love, this fundamental belief and regret that selfless love is so rare. And of course, this pushes us toward the spiritual, yes? This idea of selfless love or sacrificial love. How often does that actually occur and exist? And it's part of why for her love can be so consistently disappointed because we all have a dream of love. Yes. And there are all kinds of love. Yes. A parent's love, but then a partner's love. And we all want our partners to be sacrificial. Yes. But the reality for Carson McCullers is that that's super rare and leads to so many human complications. She believes that we are fundamentally frustrated when we can't attain the kind of love we have in our head, but we don't think we really deserve and we can't find it. And so, it's this constant, her, her novels are full of tension in this way. She says, ideally, 
Love should provide the amalgamation through which separate individuals relate to one another or a group. And I'll explain that more in a second. Um, you also see very the very Southern nature of the book. She is not afraid to grapple with racial um, issues. And you'll see that in this novel as well. Um, the hatred, the violence, the bitterness. Um, if I were in charge of the world, I would say for me, her fundamental um, theme is the inability to communicate effectively. That even though it's our heart's desire, most people aren't very good at it. And you watch her characters trying desperately um, to communicate and they can't. And why is that? She, so fundamentally, and she argues this, somewhere in all of this mess of a town and a book, what she's trying to show is that agape, communal love, is superior to eros or passionate love. I don't know. <laughs> Do you think? Agape is a very religious word, isn't it, God? What's the deal with that word? What's the deal with it? Yeah, what's the Presbyterian line on agape? <laughs> It's a famous book by C.S. Lewis, The Four Love. Oh, yeah, that guy. You know, Storge and Eros and Phileo and Agape. Agape is the uh, the rendering of of uh, the New Testament or the Old Testament, uh, uh, God's steadfast love. Yes. Uh, so it's, you know, this self giving love, not uh, maybe about self giving. So it's a Unique New Testament Koine Greek word. Beautiful. And you've all been exposed to this idea. And I really want you to have that in your head because when you begin this book, I don't think any of that is very apparent. And Carson McCullers said in writing the book, um, uh, when she um, wrote um, a treatment of the novel, a proposal for the book, first of all, it was called The Mute. Um, she said, here's what I want this book to be about, but it's not going to be apparent. The reader has to figure this stuff out. She is the one who said, Agape, communal love, is superior to passionate love. She said, this is her quote, the passionate individual love, the old Tristan is old love, the Romeo and Juliet love, the Eros love is inferior to the love of God, to fellowship to the love of agape, brotherly love, the love of humanity. But who believes that? I mean, is that what we are supposed to be working for? How many people can really do that? Do you know what I'm asking? <laughs> like, you've got your romantic love is awesome sometimes right and you've got parental love which is which just seems so so all-encompassing yes but the love of god communal love brotherly love how many of us gear our life towards that how, how did you get that? 
Y'all, sometimes when I watch TV, like our <laughs> that, it freaks me out. Um, yeah, it freaks me out. <laughs> I, I don't even know how do you I know it's freaky um so my question is we all know what we're supposed to be doing here in church yes but most of us this idea this notion that the love of God and the love of each other is superior to any other kind of love. How do you get there? Because essentially what that means is it's selfless. And most of us can't do that. No matter how well-intended we are, yes? Until you become a grandparent. Do you think? Uh, I'll show you some pics. Um, <laughs> Okay, but as a grandparent, that's your child's child. That's a different kind of love than what you feel for old Hank. For sure. Right? I think so. And it is different than the love of your group. Yeah? And I think about this in terms of, you know, when I was in college, at the College of Charleston, where they still make you wear a long white dress to graduate. <laughs> Dear girl. <laughs> Pretty interesting. Um, I love that school. <clears throat> there were eight. Lived together. And at that moment in my life, when I was 18, I thought, oh, my gosh. This is the most love I've ever felt or experienced until I met the Citadel boyfriend. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And then I still love him, but the intensity wasn't the same, right? And I was so willing to. I got to go to the beach with the Citadel, right? And then that, and then you have a child and you feel like, oh, well, this is what pure love is. Yes. But that pure love is different from agape. So how does anybody ever get there? Do you get what I mean? And this is what Carson McCullers is grappling with her entire life and she always saw herself as an outsider um she always saw herself as lonely isolated you know this little columbus georgia girl in new york city and essentially i don't know if she was ever happy do you get what i mean so this search that for her never ended philosophically sounds like the love we should all be seeking. But the real problem is, how do we get there? Do you get what I mean? Because if you, if you break it down and look at it realistically, Is anybody really capable of selfless love or love for the group, love for your fellow person in a way that brings you closer to an understanding of the ways of God? Do you get what I mean? It's hard if you really, so most of us don't live in that space, yes, because it's too uncomfortable. So that's what Carson McCullers is essentially about. This book is published in 1940. So she's writing right on the border of 
if you know what this means, fine. If you don't, it's no big deal. Um, between American modernism and postmodernism. And because her essential focus is on love in all of its various forms, and her novels are populated by weirdos. People found it hard to, most people didn't go, I can't put this book down. <laughs> because they just didn't get what was happening. You've probably got to be a little weird to think that. <laughs> You've got to be Southern, right? I'm say ownership of that. So here's how she puts the book together. And then I want to look at this passage with you. She explained to the publishers that she wanted to put this book together like a symphony. That the book would have very clear movements and that the voices would be contrapuntal, which suggests you have one voice at a time that is clear and resonant and more obvious, but you've also got all these other voices in the background, sounds in the background that add to whoever the major person is at any given point. I'm not musical or a musician. If you are, I think that probably really made sense to you. Um, and maybe you can help us. I can explain it in a technical way, but she wanted this book, which totally makes sense. Her whole life was music. She wanted the book to be musical. But it's a musical book about a bunch of weirdos. So how does that work exactly? And I think John Bailey's actually a little right when he goes, you got to be a certain kind of person. Okay, it's, it's probably true. Um, I've read Southern literature my whole life. This book resonates with me and it has a sound I really recognize. Um, Plus I do folklore. So all of this weirdness is for me kind of fairy tale-ish and surreal. It doesn't bother me. What you have to do as a reader is figure out how are those voices working? Is the book actually musical and clear at the end? I don't know what you'll think about that. I'll also tell you this, when we start looking at the text next week, I don't know if this will mean anything to you, it depends on where you are. She wanted the main character of the book to be singer. And what may happen is that he's not. And we gotta kind of figure out what to do with that. because all the other grotesques are attracted to him she wanted him to sort of be she described him as the wheel i don't know if that's the right word but that's what she said and that the other characters were like spokes kind of radiating around him but what happens more often than not is that people think and it may be true that Mick is the main character. It's a coming of age kind of story for her. If Mick does become the main character, is there a problem? In other words, did she mess up? So I want you to keep your eye on that. And what is it that she's trying to do with a main character who cannot hear or speak. Occasionally he'll write some things and there's great stuff here. You know, he's an engraver, which is all about writing, yes? Um, but he can't hear and he can't speak. He can read lips. 
So he can hear, but all the people are drawn to him. Even though in some ways he's the biggest oddity in the town. Well, actually it's his friend, but I don't, I don't wanna, I didn't want to do spoilers, okay? But everybody's attracted to him. Why and what is she suggesting through that character? And then how Ben does Mick maybe outstrip or surpass Singer as the main character? And if she does, what does that mean? I don't know how many copies I have of this. It, 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 she... No, there there are a lot of resonances for me with To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm -hmm. well, and, and, yeah, some people might need to share. And it's very different writing. Yes. But by the same token, a lot of the themes are, are very similar. Yes. Me. And I mean, the obvious one is Mick yeah. and Scout. Yes. Um, uh, so that'll be something that everybody can think about and say yay or nay to, but. And, you, and <laughs> you're right too that Mick, um, there's a lot of Carson McCullers in Mick. And even that ambiguous name, right? Mick is not a typical girl name. Um, and she has typical girl sisters. Um, and, it's, and you're right. It's super interesting that I'm I'm thinking off the top of my head of three different uh, female Southern right, well four, um, that do these coming of age kinds of books with Southern girls. But Flannery O'Connor never does it, right? Hers is just all the grotesque. But the narrative voice, I thought about scale as well. But the narrative voice in this one, a whole lot, in my, 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 a whole lot different from the adult scout looking back on 100% years than this almost godlike narrative. Beautiful. Have I not just taught that, Hank? <laughs> About the narrator. Yeah, you're exactly right. And I think that's also on purpose. And I'm glad you said this almost godlike narrator kind of looking down um, this uh, pretty omniscient uh, narrator, not fully omniscient. Like he doesn't always tell us what characters are thinking, but sometimes the narrator does that. Keep your eye on that. Super smart. Okay, you ready for this? I think more than anything by Carson McCullers um, that I've read, this is the passage that I love the most. Um, it's like, like you can get Carson McCullers from this. This is from the Ballad of the Sad Cafe. First of all, love is a joint experience between two persons. But the fact that it is a joint experience does not mean that it is a similar experience to the two people involved. There are the lover and the beloved, but these two come from different countries. Often the beloved is only a stimulus for all the stored up love, which had lain quiet within the lover for a long time hitherto. And somehow every lover knows this. He feels in his soul that his love is a solitary thing. He comes to know a new strange loneliness. And it is this knowledge which makes him suffer. He comes to know a new strange loneliness. I want to come back to that. So there is only one thing for the lover to do. He must house his love within himself as best he can. He must create for himself a whole new inward world, a world intense and strange, complete in itself, 
let it be added that this lover about whom we speak need not necessarily be a young man saving for a wedding ring. This lover can be a man, woman, child, or indeed any human creature on this earth. Now, the beloved can also be of any description. The most outlandish people can be the stimulus for love. A man may be a doddering great-grandfather and still love only a strange girl he saw in the streets of Chiha one afternoon two decades past. The preacher may, have, may love a fallen woman. The beloved may be treacherous, greasy-headed, and given to evil habits. Yes, and the lover may see this as clearly as anyone else, but that does not affect the evolution of his love one whit. A most mediocre person can be the object of a love which is wild, extravagant, and beautiful as the poison lilies of the swamp. A good man may be the stimulus for a love both violent and debased, or a jabbering madman may bring about in the soul of someone a tender and simple idol. Therefore, the value and quality of any love is determined solely by the lover himself. It is for this reason that most of us would rather love than be loved. Almost everyone wants to be the lover. And the curt truth is that in a deep secret way, the state of being loved is intolerable to many. The beloved fears and hates the lover and with the best of reasons for the lover is forever trying to strip bare his beloved. The lover craves any possible relation with the beloved, even if this experience can cause him only pain. What? A sad woman. Yeah. But maybe not wrong. Well, of course she's wrong. I mean, why would you, if you're, if you're in love with your spouse, mm -hmm. why would you feel isolated and lonely? I mean, because what she is saying is that when we love, it is a singular experience. That's you loving someone. I agree. And I think that's where I lost her after that sentence. Okay. So here's what she's saying. So the love that you have for another person, let's do partners. She says that the beloved stimulates this love in you. But the way you love a person is singular to you, right? Another person is not going to love you exactly like you love them. It's impossible. Right, but it doesn't mean they don't love you and therefore you don't have to be isolated and lonely. She's not saying that. What she's saying is the fact that the way you love someone is singular for her is sometimes lonely and isolating because nobody's ever going to fully understand the love that's in your heart. And then what she says is for, that's why most of us would rather be the lover than the beloved because the beloved is the object of love, which means the beloved may never measure up to your expectation or your desire for love. You all have seen this a million times in real life. I love that Paul Trout endlessly, but I know the way I love him is not the same way he loves me. I know it. It does not make me feel isolated and lonely. But it's a very grown-up kind of love, right? Because we were both in our 30s before 
we ever even <laughs> met each other. Now, when I <clears throat> was in love with the Citadel boyfriend, totally different case because I idolized him. I adored him. I made him into this heroic first love thing. And he did not love me in that way. And it drove me crazy. <laughs> that made me feel lonely and isolated. And I'm sure it drove him crazy because he probably thought I was a big nutbag. Because there I was, that romantic English major following him around going, let me, let me cook for you. And right? That's what she's talking about. And she's suggesting most of us would rather be the lover because we're the ones who have something in our hearts that is passionate and sometimes beautiful, unleashed into the world. That's power. It's rewarding. The problem is finding the recipient that's willing to embrace that. But no two people will ever love the same way. No two people ever grieve the same way. How many marriages dissolve over grief, over the loss of something, right? A person years earlier, you adored, yes? And what she's saying is there's, and we're gonna get into this, the very Carson McCullers thing. She believes that each of us has what she calls an inner root. That's just us, it's very Hawthorne, right? That, that idea that there's something um, fundamental about each of our hearts that nobody can quite reach. And if you try too hard, that's what Hawthorne calls the unpardonable sin. For Carson McCullers, the very fact that no one would ever love her, this is how she felt, I'm not saying she got it right. The fact that no one would ever love her in the exact same way she loved them made her feel lonely. <clears throat> Does that make sense? I did not say she's right. You're, and Sue, of course, I mean, she's way ahead of the curve here on, on this, but you're going to see that this theme played out mm -hmm. over and over and over. And I'm thinking as she's talking, even relatively early in the book, Portia, it's an African-American woman yes. and her father. I mean, it's exactly yes. as Sue has described it. So you'll try it on. I don't know whether it works or not, but and, that's what she's doing. And maybe if you think about love. Because she never did find no, love that was she did not. Like, no. no, and she really felt that this thing she was searching for so desperately was God. The selfless, all-encompassing, completely rewarding love that human beings struggle with so much. Um, and if you think about it, and I think that's a beautiful example, because if you think about it, not in terms of your romantic partner, think about it between parents and children, right? How children often don't feel inside the love we think as parents we have. Do you get what I mean? Otherwise, the world would be great, wouldn't it? In other words, um, the ways in which that parental love that for many of us is just for me, all consuming, you know, in their adolescence at some point, they feel like you don't love them or that you don't love like them as much as you love the other, the other one. But yeah. I feel smothered by it. Yes. That's the role 
of the beloved. That's why I think I get it, yeah. right? That that the beloved is just the person you pour all of that into. And it's it can be overwhelming. How can anybody live up to that? So that's what she's saying is there's this constant tension and she but wants it. That's why Singer is the object of all these people. Yes. It's sort of a blank slate that they can take whatever they need from without, and he can be oblivious to it in some ways. Yeah, that they're taking from him not only what they need, but what they only imagine he's giving. Exactly. They, yeah. So we're going to get into that, that already, because yeah. Singer, I don't know, he's an interesting figure. This book, okay, do you see how this very simple, beautiful book just became really complex? But ultimately it is for this search, at least for Carson McCullers, the search for whatever God or agape is to her. What, what's her religious background? So Presbyterian. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. I don't know which church, but yeah, she's raised Presbyterian. Well, right. So uh, I think that explains a lot, people. We so we, we so had so all the questions right here in this building right. that are all answered. So was Annie Diller. Yeah. Yeah. But how does also the fact that, um, I mean, what I read is that she was a lesbian and she really wanted these relationships with women and never was able to have that fulfilled. So from the time she was Mick, an adolescent, she felt... No, I mean person. I know. So from the time she was that, oh. in adolescence, she never felt comfortable in her skin. It's why she started calling herself Carson. Um, but she falls <clears throat> madly in love with and marries this guy, Reese McCullers. And they get divorced and married again. Um, is a very convoluted, difficult relationship. Now, most people would I ha, would identify her as bisexual, mm -hmm. but I don't think she even really understood it or grappled with it. But she did have a couple of relationships she did. before she remarried. Him. Yes. And then when she married him, she got really depressed. Yes. And he the same. Um, and oh, so right, right. and and uh I mean she tried to commit suicide. And then yeah. And so in many ways, I think she's exactly the, like everything that was Carson McCullers is on the page. Someone who's trying to figure out where do you find this kind of love that isn't going to either strip you bare or drive someone else away and drive someone crazy. And she knows partly because of her religious upbringing that it's supposed to be God. What she struggled with as a writer and as a person is, if human beings can't do this, can't get to a place in their own lives where they actually experience selfless or sacrificial love, how are we ever going to get spiritually, physically, whatever, fulfilled? Yeah, she had a crazy life. And her um, biography is really good. Um, I don't think she knew what she was doing most of the time. They both were really, really heavy drinkers too. I think they really loved each other, but really hurt each other. And that's why she's constantly sort of going, can two people actually love each other the same at the same time? 
Oh, it's there you go. I have to go home. <laughs> yeah. No, it's hard. It's, yes. I mean, she's just a troubled person. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of people in the world who are not troubled who don't have that problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but two people still don't love each other the same way. But that's right. But that's okay. But that they don't have to. They still can friends. love each other. Not they can still love each other, but not in the same way. And that's mm -hmm. okay. It is okay. Uh, Let's just fine. all love each other. Yeah, I'm not saying she's right. And I think you're right. This for her was really troubling. Like how she just wants, right? She just wants. She wants to get to God. She wants to get to what God is supposed to be and what's supposed to represent. But she doesn't know how to do it. She should have gone to the Pentecostal church so that they could have told her exactly what that was. Yeah. Amen. They could have answered her question. Donna, we can do this. So for next week, can we get to get through part one? Which in my book is like 70-ish pages. And we'll get introduced to the main characters. Okay, my book, it's 90 pages. Can we get that far? Come on, y'all were reading 100 pages a week on that Damon Copperfield. Mm -hmm. And this is actually the print speaker. Um, let's get as far as you can into part, oh, like see if we can get, make it to part two, set up the major players and the problems. And let's see if we can make this all end happily. <laughs> we can do it. All right, y'all. Have a great week. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good start now. Like to see you. I don't know. We have to carry a dozen friends, and the men might not be. And so she likes her people to come home. And she gives you Friday night. Well, that was just a good thing.
Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's what I thought. I was like, yeah, that's great. And I'm gonna yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we're gonna be Thursday and drive part way in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Bye -bye. Uh, I think so. Yes. No, well, don't worry. I'm, if I we'll, we'll I'm, be I'm there. Be we'll there. be there for sure. Uh, and, you know, I always ch challenge to get there early. I mean, I can, I'll be there. Don't but, worry about that. But yeah, yeah we'll get just so y'all get there early to set up. I can help clean up. Yeah. I'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> I say yeah. just pickleball groups of type group. I will. Yeah. We're well represented in this class. We yeah. are. Thank you.